Uh, last but not least, uh, Ken Spears, VP, uh, General Manager of Boston Scientific. Ken. So uh, thank you. I've got uh, a prepared deck, and I'm going to skin you down a little bit um, uh, for the sake of time, but I think we can also hit on, on the key drivers of where I'm going. So I'm going to jump in near the, the back end of this slide, near the bottom of this slide, and I'm going to challenge the notion that Ontario has an innovation adoption problem. Right? And, and so it, it's funny, as I look around the ecosystem, I work in this ecosystem, I spend a lot of time in the Ontario ecosystem, and I haven't heard uh, from anyone or seen any evidence that uh, people are philosophically opposed to adopting innovation, nor have I seen any evidence in this system where the system is averse to adopting responsibly uh, meaningful innovation into the health system. So I would suggest that we don't have an innovation problem in this province. I would suggest that we have an innovation funding problem in this province. And, and I think this is where I want to spend a little bit of time with you this morning, talking about the convergence of health policy and health economic policy. And there's experiences that we can draw on from other global uh, countries facing some of the similar problems that we're facing, and we apply some of that knowledge uh, to the Canadian experience. So, the first, that's not advancing. Oh, you got to think, hey, press it hard, okay. So, before we launch into the consideration of this radical idea, and the idea I'm going to propose is investing in innovation. Investing in innovation to attract foreign investment, to attract the enabling capabilities to create an export capability in this country and in this province to support and enable the funding of uptake of new innovation. So it's a pretty radical idea, but before we move there, let's satisfy ourselves that we don't have another option. And that other option is is the cutting of current costs, the, the reallocation of current health care costs, and then using that bounty to fund the uptake of innovation. So on the far left, um, what we see, and we talk about this often, the rising costs of health care is a problem. Well, the reality of it is, is the rising cost of health care isn't the problem. It's the rising cost of health care in relation to our ability to pay for it. That's the problem. And you can see the two lines. There's clear separation where the, the, uh, the cost of health care rising considerably more than our ability to pay on the bottom line. And this has been going on for a while. And what happens when this goes on is we have to fund health care out of debt. And then that takes us to the, the middle graph. And what the middle graph shows is that the debt in this province has doubled from the year 2000 to now. So we've got escalating debt um, that, that we're grappling with. The demands and the, uh, the appetite for health care and to fund health care continues to grow. And the scenario that I asked uh, some groups, or some the economists within my team, what would it look like if we had to cut the health care expense in order to make it affordable? What would it look like if we went back, identified a time and place in the year 2000 when health care was affordable, where we weren't counting on health care um, uh, debt to fund health care? And so if we gave health care today a haircut to make it affordable, what would that look like? And the calculations on the screen what that would look like is we would have to, in this province, cut $13 billion out of the somewhere between 54 and $57 billion health care spend annually. That's a more than 20% reduction. And I'm not sure if anyone in this room has the appetite for that. I'm not sure uh, the Ontario electorate or patients would have an appetite for that. So this sets up this question. Um, are we able to shrink ourselves into greatness? Can we cut fast enough and far enough to fund our expectation and demands for the uptake of new innovative technology. And I, I don't believe that we can. And so we have to, as responsible Ontarians, look for examples of how other countries have done this. I'm gonna share a quick example of uh, what I believe is a really cool metaphor for solving two things. Solving a healthcare problem, and at the same time, driving economic bounty. So there are ways to do that simultaneously. And what I'm showing you here, and there's a lot there, but I'm going to hit the highlights. This is the Japanese experience. And in 2012, Japan had a problem, right? They had an aging population, an aging population that was bolsing through the system and was going to require significant amount of health care resources, and they didn't have a tax base enough to fund that, that bolus movement. So the strategy was, why don't we try to keep this population productive and working in the workforce longer. That was the strategy. 
The second problem that Japan had back in 2012 was the fact that they'd had two straight decades of stagnant economic growth, flatline economic growth. So these are the two problems. They've got a health care issue. They've got an economic issue. Well, fortunately, in 2013, they also won a Nobel Prize in the area of regenerative medicine. And so Shinsu Ibe, who was the prime minister and still is, um, decided that he was going to fit that platform into his Ebenomics strategy. And what he decided to do was use investment to create a regenerative medicine cluster that the world would come to. So what happened? Shinzu invested a billion dollars over 10 years. That was his commitment. And then he also went in and he gave quicker access to those companies willing to do research and development in Japan. And what happened? He grew economic activity by $6 billion in, in the course of three years. So his original investment, $1 billion over 10, he grew $6 billion of economic activity in three years. That economic activity is forecasted to grow to $30 billion by 2030. A significant economic boost and a significant economic bounty. And what I like about this, again, this is a, this is a, a powerful theme. It is possible and Japan's proved that it is possible to solve economic problems and to solve healthcare problems simultaneously where patients win, where providers win, where payers win, and industry wins and is motivated to do it again. And that's what's happening in Japan, right? So they solved the problems and became prosperous doing it. Japan's not the only country that's realized this. Japan realized that there's uh, an amount, a, a serious amount of dollars out there internationally that is available to integrated economies that are willing to compete for those dollars. Um, the four examples here, I'll take you through really, really quickly, but these countries have recognized that they're competing for these dollars. And I would suggest to this room and to this province and, and payers uh, in Canada and policymakers that we need to look at these resources and these resource pools as resources that we have to compete for. We have to differentiate the value that we have and go out and seize them. Uh, Sweden is a good example. I think uh, ICHOM came up and, and, and what Sweden has done to attract investment to Sweden is they've created this knowledge economy. They're leading the world in healthcare transformation and they're going to export that knowledge to all of us, everyone else and they're going to translate that into um, economic bounty for the country of Sweden. Germany, Germany adopts and diffuses innovation better and faster than anyone else in the world. And that attracts huge amounts of investments to Germany. Germany has always valued innovation and technology and they're using it again to not only drive the state of their healthcare and the outcomes in their healthcare system, but to revolutionize their economy to a knowledge economy. Uh, Australia, Australia is interesting, it's smaller than Canada. They've aligned um, the public state stakeholder and the regulatory framework to create an advantage for people wanting to do early clinical research and get access to a market with clinical approval. They've taken the friction out of their RA process in Australia to create a differentiation. Denmark's really cool, Denmark's about six million people. Um, half the size of Ontario, they're making a big statement, punching way above their weight in this world economy, creating an exportable um, um, uh, export economy that attracts billions of dollars to that small country. And I know I've uh, run in pretty close to out of time, but I'm going to hit this last point. You've heard this theme, you've heard the theme, I think all the speakers talk about it in one way or another. We can compete. Ontario can compete, and not only can they compete, we can compete and win. We can compete and win by driving better patient outcomes, better access to patients to our health system, while simultaneously driving economic bounty in this province. We can create an environment that attracts investments, that attracts an environment where SMEs can not only win, but they can win in their own backyard, and then export that knowledge and monetize that experience. This is what we need to do as, as Ontarians, as Canadians, to put ourselves on a platform where we're considered to be a world leader in, in health care. I'm not going to go through recommendations. I believe it's, it's, it's relatively self-explanatory. I will end with this slide, however, and I, I think there is a cost to not doing anything. I think there is a cost to riding the status quo, 
And, and I also believe that we have to find a way to disrupt the way that we view health policy and health economics and find a way to bring them together as other countries have done and win on both fronts. Thank you very much for your time.